Okay. We are actually running a couple minutes early, which is another thing that's kind of unheard of with film festivals. Um, the filmmakers of that last film have currently joined us, and hopefully a couple other filmmakers will be joining us momentarily. Anna Mendes and Danny LeClaire are the ones who made that final film, uh, a friend of mine. We just finished watching Bird of Greed, Sanctuary, A Key to Memory, A Weeping in the Woods, The Puzzle, High School Reflections, Uber Mom, The Caretaker, and A Friend of Mine. Glad to be joined by some of our filmmakers up here on stage. We have Nathaniel Lathrop with us, who made A Key to Memory, and Lori Nussbaum, who made The Puzzle. We're four minutes early from when we should have started our, our live stream, so we may have a couple more filmmakers join us uh, virtually uh, in just a minute here. Hello, Nathaniel. Hello, Lori. Lori, um, this is her first film in the film festival, but um, she's been a long time volunteer with us at the film festival. So a little bit different territory for you to actually be on stage now after spending most of the time running mics up and down stairs and hand, handing out lanyards. Now you're actually affiliated with, by the way, nice shorts too. Thank you. Thought I'd bust out the puzzle oh, shorts. Yeah, yeah. It, it, is this a, a little awkward, a little weird to be on, on stage after so many of these? It is. I, I have to like tell myself not to grab the mic and go run it. <laughs> well, hello, Anna, and hello, Danny. We appreciate you joining us. And it looks like we have one more filmmaker, Cosmo, is joining us. Cosmo uh, was the maker of Bird of Greed. Hello, Cosmo. We, uh, we actually wrapped Whoa. just a minute ago. We're running a little bit early, which is kind of unheard of with film festivals. So we, we may have a couple people uh, join us uh, over the course of, of this call, but we appreciate uh, the three of you taking some time to participate. And hello to our live streaming audience. Um, as a reminder, this is actually the only film festival in the entire country that can do this, where we're sitting down in a theater, granted limited capacity, but still the only one in the entire country that has this capability. And we're also presenting the entire festival online and with a live streaming audience. So uh, for anyone who is following us online, there is a chat room where you can leave questions. For those of us in the audience, there are two microphones set up on either side of the stage with a little X on the carpet. You can walk up and ask a question there. So Anna and Danny up here, they were the makers of A Friend of Mine, which was the, the very last film that, that we watched there. Um, Cosmo uh, was the maker of the very first film that we watched in this block, Bird of Greed. Nathaniel made A Key to Memory, which was the uh, nostalgic trip through uh, a house with, with lots of mystery. Um, Lori Nussbaum made the puzzle, and then also uh, Martin Hillegas was supposed to be joining us, but he had a feature film opportunity come up, but his family is here on his behalf, uh, and he made The Caretaker, which was that kind of that thriller uh, uh, homage to old horror films and seemed very Jaws-influenced in, in, in its vibe. I, I, I like that respect. Um, so it seems like we already have an audience question over here. Oh, is The Caretaker a person here? Um, his family is here. He was not, not able to attend in person. Um, but I did get a chance to talk to him beforehand. Uh, if you, you have a question about the caretaker. Well, in the caretaker, was the young man going for the job, um, going for the job that the other guy was doing, and he was going to take his place? Well, the, the idea is the way that Martin described it to me was that the young man was actually being set up. He was supposed to be dinner for the, the creature. Oh. But the creature instead ate the actual caretaker. And so the, he then becomes the new caretaker for the creature. I, I, I kind of gave the impression that he was going to be the new caretaker, and then got caught up. That, in that's kind of what he was sold, and maybe the old caretaker didn't realize that he was on the menu that night. Uh, so that, that's kind of how, how that film played out. Um, I, interesting film that had, um, it, it wasn't blatantly obvious, but it had sort of the subtle homages to films like Jaws and and other kind of horror thriller films, a little bit of like Nightmare on Elm Street there, maybe a little Lake Placid, uh, Friday the 13th vibe to it. So good job to uh, Martin Hill Hilligas, and thank you for the Hilligas family for joining us here. Um, Lori, let, let's talk about your project first, the, the puzzle. What made you want to do a stop motion film? 
Yeah. Um, well, I've had a little bit more time uh, earlier this spring, uh, so I started doing more puzzles. I've always enjoyed doing puzzles, and it helps me relax and just with everything going on. And I've been a member of Klamath Films for the last three years. And um, yeah, I sort of did this really challenging puzzle, and I didn't want to just put it in the box. And I got um, uh, a notification somehow about KIF deadline and stuff and so just because of seeing that in the puzzle and it just sort of like let's let's do a short a stop motion for the puzzle did you have any idea going into it how difficult stop motion animation is no <laughs> I completely uh, 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 underestimated that one um, I have so much more respect um, for anybody who does stop motion um, it definitely was a lot more challenging and I definitely learned a lot through the process. Um, so anybody who's thinking about doing a stop motion, I would just recommend try it on something and, and see how it goes and you learn a lot through the process. Yours was not the only stop motion animation film we had in this festival. We also had a K through 12 stop motion film made by a six year old. So it, it's it's between you and, and a six year old girl for, uh, for, for Stop Motion Supremacy at 2020 Klamath Independent Film Festival. Uh, Nathaniel, your film, uh, A Key to Memory, where did the concept for, for that film come from? Uh, it was based off of um, what I think goes on in my mom's mind, because that location is actually, uh, it's in upstate New York, and every summer when she was younger, she would travel or she would visit uh, my grandpa and great grandma there. And that's the house that she would stay in. And the bedroom at the end was actually where she slept every night. So um, every time we visit there, uh, I know that she's seeing stuff in her head that used to happen, you know, who used to sit in that chair, who was cook cooking dinner, that sort of thing. Um, so the most recent time that we were there, we had like a week and a half. So I was like, you know, I should probably, uh, it'd be really cool to film something. And I had that concept in my head beforehand um, a while back, but I thought, you know, might as well just push forward. So I uh, spent a lot of time storyboarding it in my head, and then we just shot it in one day. Uh, and then I went back home and finished it. Terrific. Um, Cosmo, let, let's check in with, with you, sir. Uh, Cosmo was part of our Friday night, uh, opening night kickoff party as well. His film, Bird of Greed, um, he's based in Portland, and he drove eight hours to find his shoot location uh, for the, the uh, Alvord Desert, which those of us down here may, may know, but it's about as obscure of a location that you can find in, in Oregon. So for those who are here now but maybe didn't participate in Friday, Cosmo, maybe you can explain why would you go through such arduous lengths to find such an obscure location to, to make your film? Well, it was uh, twofold. I wanted to do a camping trip with my friends that was also a road trip, kind of like a bonding experience. And we chose Alvar Desert because wherever you wanted the camera, it was just added production value. And it's my understanding that you, uh, the landscape, as beautiful as it is in, in your film, presented some difficulties as far as the filmmaking process itself. Do you, you want to explain the... Uh, uh, some of the road conditions and the um, bee situation that you went through? Certainly. So the Alvar Desert, uh, as you can tell by watching Bird of Greed, is very dry, which makes it very warm and hot because the sun is just constantly beating down on you. So dehydration was an issue, so we always wanted to make uh, water breaks essential. But one thing that we did not plan for were the swarms of bees that were infesting the desert. I think they wanted our water, but all the bees there in all the shots, you can actually see them in the scene when I'm waking up from the campfire. You can see bees fly past the screen, but it made the audio unusable for basically everything we recorded, which is okay because there was no dialogue. Right, but still, in, in the course of filming, now, you acted in the film, but uh, for your, your crew, if you're directing, uh, when, how difficult is it to stay in character, and how difficult is it to maintain hold of a camera steady when you're being attacked by a swarm of bees? 
So thankfully the bees weren't too much of an issue. Uh, every time they would swarm us, we would just walk about 10 feet one direction and things would look the same because it's just dry land wherever you look. So the one thing that was an issue uh, when filming was that there were tire tracks all around the desert and people just driving out there wanting to camp like ourselves. And so it was actually pretty difficult trying to find uh, shots where there weren't uh, active tile tire tracks in the background. And a quick funny anecdote about that, our rented minivan actually, in fact, got stuck out in the desert in some mud when we were trying to drive in the middle of the night, we couldn't see anything. And so we spent two hours, two, yeah, two to three hours having to dig our minivan out of the mud. And it, we lost a lot of sleep, but we ended up getting out and we finished the film. Terrific. Well, let's check in with Anna and Dan. Thank you, both of you, for, for joining us. Uh, so Anna and Dan were both SOU students that yep. recently graduated. And the film that we watched, a, a friend of mine, was their senior project, correct? Yes. Terrific. Um, what a brave topic to try to tackle. And it presents its own issues in terms of filming to try to tell a story about rape. Um, what was the motivation behind wanting to create a film about the PTSD that comes out of a rape, and how difficult was that to try to film in terms of getting a cast and crew together, knowing that you're addressing such a serious topic? Yeah, um, from one thing that like I kind of remember is the Me Too movement. I think like, we'll never forget that. And I think specifically in the film industry, we wanted to show that this is something that um, but as for casting and crew, we had to really talk to everyone and do a lot of research, um, a lot of the you know, agreement forms. Um, but I don't know. I just wanted to like share this story, and I know it's it's a hard topic. Um, and like, I've never experienced this, so it's hard to pull from someone else's experience what it is in their point of view into a story. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Anna. Your mic's cutting out just a little bit, but I think we got most of that. Um, Danny, would you like to add anything to, to what Anna said there re regarding uh, putting this film together? No, I, I think that Anna hit it uh, pretty much in the head there. Um, this was a pretty tough topic for both of us to cover, but we wanted to create something that was a little bit more realistic and painted the situation in a light that um, was more realistic than what you might see in the other genres, the other films. So um, it was a challenge, but Bert and I both had a, a great time completing it. Terrific. Um, sticking with, with you two for, for a minute, um, have you had a chance to show this film I anywhere yet? And if so, what kind of conversations have come out of it? Because this seems like a great film to spark a dialogue. Yeah, so before, sorry again for my microphone, our internet is a bit. Um, but before uh, Clean It, we showed it at the SFU Student Film Festival. Um, but that was also live stream, not in person. Um, that's the only one, and then this one, obviously. But I remember um, Danny has a story that his aunt texted him in response. Danny? Yeah, my uh, aunt, she has a daughter who's 13, and she showed the film to her daughter, and they had a dialogue and, and talked about rape and sexual assault and how these things may happen. Uh, you know, we, we hope not, but these things do happen across colleges and high schools and everywhere else throughout the country. And so my aunt thought it would be a great film for her daughter to see just what this looks like, and, uh, how to go through the motions. And uh, I think they had a really good conversation about it. And it was an awkward one, my aunt said, but sometimes the awkward, difficult conversations are the ones that we need to have. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel, coming back, back to you with uh, a key to memory. Um, 
this project, first of all, the cinematography in it is beautiful. You did a, a fantastic job with just setting the atmosphere of, of it. Um, it. It's the kind of thing where if people are going to do a film that only has kind of that reminiscent ba background dialogue and they're leaving something open to interpretation, sometimes they can kind of fall into some artsy uh, traps, you know, some, some, some pitfalls where people think they, they have to, everyone has to be Fellini, uh, you know, for all, all of a sudden. Um, but your film had not some beautiful camera angles and some really great scene setting stuff where people get drawn in, into the atmosphere. But I'm curious about the the ambiance of it, the the background. Can you talk about how you put together like some of those soft um, background sounds and kind of set the tone for um, like you didn't do special effects where you flew like in ghosts or anything, but it it, it had the vibe like. If it's not memories, it's you know like that whole concept of like living memories and, and ghosts a little bit kind of thrown in a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, all of the sound design in that was uh, recorded afterwards, either grabbed from an uh, audio library in my editing software, um, or I recorded it myself. There's only one sound effect that was real, and that was when she's walking up the stairs, um, is the footsteps. But um, yeah, so there are certain things like, uh, like at the beginning of the, the second portion, when you hear the boy pick up the telephone, uh, I moved the camera uh, as if I was following him, even though he wasn't there. Uh, and then trying to capture angles that would be reminiscent of where those characters would be. Um, so a lot of yeah, so a lot of the things were recorded afterwards, like the rustling of paper. Um, I was able to grab footsteps from the audio library, uh, like in the grass or on the floor. Um, I couldn't record on set because I didn't have a microphone. And also the main uh, parlor room was actually filled with quite a few inches of Timothy seed because that was where they stored the seed. So it wouldn't have made sense to have rustling <laughs> in the parlor. Um, but yeah, and then I, when recording, I was trying to figure out, um, I don't know, I was listening to it today and didn't quite sound right, but um, trying to record the audio uh, in relation to the distance that the person would be. It's like the kid telling, picking up the telephone is a close up. So I was trying to record closer audio. And then from the more distant stuff, you know, vice versa. Okay, great. Uh, Lori, this was your very first film you've ever made, right? Um, I did make a short for the Oregon Inspiration Film Festival this earlier this year. Oh, okay. Uh, that was specifically COVID, but that was a 90-second short um, and sort of goofy and just, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is your first entry in, into a film festival, and it's one you're intimately familiar with, having volunteered at basically every single one of these. Uh, but the filmmaking process for the puzzle and the philosophical aspect of it, your film has a really interesting balance in that something that a puzzle is something that you know, little kids do up to uh, uh, adults. It's something simple, something basic. And your film com comes across in that same respect. I don't mean that, that d d I, I mean that you know, very lo lovingly. Um, but then there's the philosophical overtones in, in your dialogue with it. Um, where did the concept come from for combining philosophy on life with something as simple as a jigsaw puzzle? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, Kurt. Um, well, I guess um, it's 2020. <laughs> no, um, well, and, and also, uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, a lot of puzzles I do are considered challenging. And so, um, you know, uh, and so, but this was definitely a more challenging one. And so because of its difficulty, it took a lot longer to do. And while just doing the puzzle, I mean, it gave me a lot of time to think. And just with, you know, uh, where my mind was in 2020, as well as I guess I may be philosophical other times, but it was just sort of some of the thoughts I had while doing the puzzle and then um, I decided to record that in a sort of a stream of consciousness in a way, if you will. Um, but yeah. And it was, none of it was scripted too, right? It was all just kind of off, off the cuff? Yeah, yeah. I, um, 
so I took all the pictures and compiled them and then uh, decided on the speed that they should be. And then I recorded myself as I watched it, I narrated. And I took a couple of takes, um, but definitely with my first take, that's, that's the one that you, you, uh, you all saw. Um, and it was the best one because when I tried to script it more or plan it more, it just didn't, it didn't sound right to me. And so um, I went with my original takes. Terrific. Cosmo, let, let's check in with, with you again. Uh, we appreciate your time since you were here Friday, and I've been seeing that you've watched most of our festival online now because I'm, I'm able to track who, who's watching what. So uh, thank you for being an active participant in, in, in everything. Um, can you talk a little bit about the concept behind Bird of Greed, how you came up with the storyline for it? Yeah, so the concept of the story mainly revolved around the metal detector prop that's in the film. I actually stumbled upon that in a garage sale. So it was only a the, the body part. And so I had to hunt down the, the rod and uh, the disc there that detects the metal from uh, various metal detector places in Oregon, actually. And I actually did a lot of research about uh, metal detector engineering. But I knew I wanted to film an Alvaro Desert. So once I had the metal detector, Two and two together, I uh, was searching for credit. Terrific. And you're one of our returning filmmakers. Um, you've had films in uh, the festival previous years, right? Are you working on any future projects that we'll be seeing soon? May maybe for 2021, Kiff? I just finished a, a quarantine short about what you should and shouldn't feed ducks, sort of a PSA. Uh, I live near a duck pond, and while I take walks there, I constantly see people throwing like bread and other like carb heavy food. It's actually like not healthy for those ducks. So I turned to a little short film PSA about uh, giving them something more healthy. And hopefully, I'll see that uh, next year's kit. <laughs> Terrific. And Anna and, and Danny, um, I know you said that you showed this once before. At, at SOU, um, but I'm still curious about the making of uh, of the, this film because uh, your student film uh, tread in a lot of areas that perhaps others would not have dared to go. It was a very brave film that, that, that you made, but the making of it, coordinating students to be a part of, of a film, uh, you know, some, some films, they can touch on, on uh, you know, heavy subject matter and you need to kind of prep people, but how do you prepare actors for rape scenes? Is that you could be doing something where you know it it's it it's not real? You know, film is fantasy, and we're, we're telling stories. But you could actually be causing a PTSD thing if this thing goes wrong, right? You it could turn into you know a, a, a bad situation when you're you're trying to cap. You're just trying to mimic something. You're not trying to actually have to happen. What sort of extra prep? did you and your cast have to go through uh, to prepare uh, to film for, for some of those really difficult scenes? Right, yeah. So besides a lot of um, we coordinated the separate day with Danny and I with um, Savannah and then our actor, um, Kevin. Um, we just set a day, it was just the four of us, among our small studio on campus and we just, like sat down with them and explained that, right the scene this is what we're wanting to do and what it'll look like in the camera what is it it was always anything we would figure out this we would always ask after that are you okay with that so it's the the constant reassuring and showing them like this is you know what doing on the cameras like you know the whole time um and that goes same with the crew the night we were filming the sexual assault scene um, it was only danny and i our audio and um, our scripty actors everyone else was like downstairs taking a break <laughs> um but you know there's there's like only the reassurance and confirming that, like, we're okay with it. 
time. And before filming, I talked with Alina just like one on one before shooting, just feeling we were willing to, you know, if we was on this and film on another day, we would have. That's pretty much all we did. Danny, do you want to add to that? Yeah, as the, the director of photography, you know, I, I told Aaliyah and uh, Rob, I told everyone on, on the cast, you know, I, of course, would like to get the best looking shots possible. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure that everybody is safe and comfortable first. And so once we got into the sexual assault scene, I told Aaliyah, you know, you can look at me. I'm, I'm right in front of you. And if at any point you need a break or stop, you can, we will. And we can rewrite it. We can change things. So I think that the pre-production that we did, the planning, and like Anna mentioned, the constant reassurance, checking in with them, um, really helps the actors and the crew understand that we were taking this extremely seriously. And it wasn't about getting the shot. Uh, that wasn't my, you know, my whole thing. It was more about, I want to tell a story that's comfortable, but I want to make sure that we can do it in a way that doesn't damage other people. Because then, uh, you know, that's not a good film if we're hurting our cast and crew. I think we did it as best as we could. Terrific. Well, we're coming up shortly here on our awards ceremony, and there's a little bit of prep that we need to do that. So uh, I would love to get final thoughts from all of our filmmakers about their experience making their film, if they learned anything in the process, and uh, the weird oddity of having a film festival that we can actually present in person during a global pandemic. Um, it it's a little weird for those of us coordinating it too, thinking, can we actually do this right now? Technically we can, so why shouldn't we? <laughs> um, so uh, Lori, your, your fi final thoughts, please, on, on the puzzle and about this experience of having a film in a film festival. Sure, yeah, no, um, totally surprising and uh, humbled that um, my film got into TIFF. Uh, but it definitely um, was a lot of fun to make and it will be a very memorial or memorable uh, Memorial Day weekend, because I did it over three days, uh, did about 700 squats to do the pieces removal and taking a picture each time. Uh, so it was definitely a lot of effort, um, but it was, it was a good experience. So if you do want to, again, you'll learn how to set up the structures that you're not actually doing yeah. this yeah. every single piece over and yeah. over again, right? A yep. little bit more planning, maybe a tripod? Yeah, yeah. Tripod might come in handy. <laughs> uh, Nathaniel, uh, um, I, I know you're no stranger to, to filmmaking, but uh, a key to memory. Um, is this your, your first inclusion in a film festival? And, and um, anything you'd like to share about the film? Uh, this is my second time participating in uh, a film festival this year. I did one way back in, when I was still in the K through 12 category. I had a stop motion video. Um, that showed in the Ashland Film Festival. And then I submitted this key to memory this year. Uh, so this is the second festival for the same film. So that was exciting. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, Especially in a year when there's not a lot of film festivals happening. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and uh, I was kind of realizing that this is kind of the finale for that, for this film. And uh, cause it's been on YouTube for uh, quite a few months, but after seeing it in a festival, it's kind of like, okay, well, that's the conclusion. So now it's time to start thinking about the next thing, uh, which hasn't really started yet. We should also note Lori's film, this was a world premiere of the puzzle. And because of the fluke that is 2020 with so many festivals forced to shut down and theaters not being open, you're actually the fourth world premiere that we've had at the Klamath Independent Film Festival over the course of the last three days. We've had three films as well as a world premiere trailer. So you're, you're the, the last one in, in that group, unless Cosmo, unless this was the, the debut of Bird of Greed. Had you shown Bird of Greed somewhere else? Yeah, uh, this was the second screening at a festival. Okay, well, four, wor four world premieres for Klamath. I, I think that that's pretty cool. So Cosmo, while we, we have you on the line, any final thoughts you'd like to provide about Bird of Greed or about your participation once again in the Klamath Independent Film Festival? Yeah, well, I was uh, bummed that I wasn't able to meet other filmmakers there in person. I really enjoyed my time at KIF last year and hope to be there in future years. 
but uh, Bird of Greed was really a passion project of mine, and I uh, relied on a lot of uh, close friends and relatives. Uh, shout out to my Aunt Jenny, who played the theremin, which was the sound effect of the metal detector throughout the film. A little Easter egg there. But yeah, I'd say now that we're looking to scale back our productions, I guess my one recommendation for other filmmakers is to really just look at the resources that you have and rely on your friends and family. Terrific. Anna and Danny, the floor is yours for any final thoughts you would like to provide. This is You're the, the last filmmakers in our last Q&A, and your film was the last one that we are showing amongst 37 films at the 8th Annual Klamath Independent Film Festival. It's it's definitely been an honor for sure. This is our first time in uh, and we couldn't be there in person. It was very strange. <laughs> uh, but one thing that I took from this whole year from a friend of mine was just allowing the risk storytelling wise, no matter what, just like go for it, the risk. It could you know end up being good in the end or not. You don't know. Um, <laughs> And hopefully um, I get to experience this next year with some more projects, hopefully in person. Terrific. Danny, is there anything that you'd like to add? I feel like I've asked that question like four times yeah, to you. Yeah, uh, this is a great uh, different experience for sure, being in a virtual festival. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be a part of it. You know, I'm very proud of the project, very proud of Anna and, uh, and all the work that uh, she did with this project. And I'm looking forward to hopefully being in Klamath next year for another festival. Anna Mendes, Danny LeClaire, Cosmos Feta, Lori Nussbaum, Nathaniel Lathrop, thank you all of you for your wonderful films and for being a part of the 8th Annual Klamath Independent Film Festival.